it's a tremendous blessing to transition out of 2023 and, and begin to experience 2024. And as Nate said, we're already a week into it. Um, because of the way the calendar year falls this year, it's different, right? I, we haven't met together for the first six days. This is the seventh day of January, and we're meeting for the first time. And we're going to gather around the Lord's table here at the end of our service. And there's no better way to begin our service, right, than to go back to the cross and remember the price that was paid. And and to remember our Savior as he, he told us to, and, and to look forward to his return, because he didn't stay dead, and, and he, he told his followers in that night in which he was betrayed, and they celebrated the, the Lord's Supper, that as often as you do this, you remember the Lord's death until he comes. He's coming back. He rose again and he ascended to the Father and he's interceding for us right now. And one day he's going to return to take his children home. And, and that should be in our mindset. That should be our focus. It should be in our heart of hearts. We should be anticipating and looking forward to that. And it, it's something that goes through our minds at the beginning of a new year, isn't it? You know, we start thinking of a number of things when we transition into a new year. And by the way, there are a number of Bible reading plans down there. If you would like to continue something that we began over 20 years ago here at the church, reading through the Bible in, in a year, there's two different plans that I know of down there. And you pick one, and there's many of them available online. Um, and, and again... I, it's hard. You're already seven days behind if you're picking it up today. Uh, don't take that the wrong way. Just catch up a little bit. And don't look at it as a duty. Look at it as a joy. And see the big picture um, of, of what God is doing and has done and his, his concept that he'll bring to consummation that we discussed during the Christmas season I encourage you, pick one of these up and continue reading through and don't beat yourself up if you're behind or you miss out, but see the big picture and develop a framework, a structure, so that if God uses his word, not if, but when he uses his word in our lives, you can go back and study more in those areas with the proper framework to understand. And I encourage you, the more that we do it, many of you have done it for many, many years. And it develops this, this construct of understanding God's word as a whole. And so I encourage you, pick up one of those plans and start reading and, and focusing on what God has in, in store. In 2022, we read the Bible through to, to see God's worldview for you and and that's going to play a little part in our theme this year as well. Um, in fact, so is our theme from last year. Um, uh, anybody remember it last year? Christ in me, the hope of glory in 2023, 2022 20, and 23, and now we're in 2024. And it's hard to believe time passes by so quickly. Folks, if you were born in 1962, this is a, a, a special year for you because you turned 62 and you were born in 1962. I celebrated a birthday yesterday of somebody very close to me. She's shaking her head over there. I don't, yeah, I don't know what she thinks. What, what do you mean? I didn't say anything. I just, those who were born in 1962 are turning 60. Just so, just a little, just, um, um, those of us born in 1961 are going to have lots of fun. And there's a bunch of us out there. I, I know a bunch of you. Six, I know uh, there's a number of us that were born. Anyway, time goes by so quickly. Would you not agree? And it needs to go by real quickly right now because I stirred up a little hornet's nest. But, but as it goes by, you know, it's hard to believe. 2024. Wow. Uh, a few days ago, I was looking at the paper. It, 
And, and, and on the, the front of this paper, it says, in search of the next action star. And, and as I was looking at it, it says here, a look at who may succeed the aging celluloid heroes. Hollywood's action heroes haven't disappeared. Many, however, have qualified for AARP. <laughs> You're getting the picture. Time's going by. It talks about Stallone. It talks about... Um, well, here, for years we've been talking about who would be the next Arnold Schwarzenegger or Stallone or Bruce Willis, but no one has claimed the title, according to Jeff Brock of Industry Tracker Exhibitor Relations. I don't know Jeff Bach, and I don't even know what that means, but it says USA Today reporter Scott Bowles looks at some top contenders for the action Don or Diva. You get the picture what it's saying there, right? And they mention people like Dwayne Johnson, like um, uh, Christian Bale, like Angelina Jolie, like Matt Damon, like Robert Downey. It shows their pros and cons, their strengths, their weaknesses, their hits, their misses, all the stuff there. And then all of a sudden I looked and up here it says Sunday, August 22nd, 2010. I, I didn't tell you, I was grabbing these to throw them in my fire to get it started. 14 years ago, you know those names. And they've come, and some have gone, and new are coming up, and things. That's what happens in a new year, isn't it? That's what happens throughout the year. And the truth is, none of us know what we are going to face this year. We don't know what we're going to face at the end of the hour, we, we have plans. We, we look forward. We plan out our calendar year. But, but most of the time, we write those in pencil uh, until they take place. Do you understand? That's, that's part of the nature of the beast. It's part of chronological time that our, our creator, God, spoke into existence. And we're going to look at that a little bit this year. And, and, you know, when it comes down to 2024, there's a whole lot of words that rhyme with four. I, I mean, think about it. You've got the word bore, and I don't want to bore you in 2024. You know, I don't want anybody to experience, never mind, bore, chore. I don't want it to be a chore like it's just a duty. It's hard. I, I, I don't want you to become sore. I want you to soar. There's a little play on words there, right? Soar from working hard, soaring high. Roar, um, drawer, floor, more, explore. You, there's bunches of them, aren't there? There really is. And so I started batting some of them around, and I was getting some help from my lovely wife over the last few weeks, but all the time she was just throwing out themes, not what we really need to focus on. I, I, Never mind, I'm getting in more and more trouble. Because there's a lot of words that rhyme with four, 20, 24, right? And they were good and things. And, and probably some of them lodged in here and sunk down here as we were thinking. But these are some options. Oh, come let us adore in 2024. That flows right on the heels of Christmas, right? What about love him to your core, the inwardmost part? In 2024, to your core. Get out the door in 2024 and share him like never before. I, I mean, all of these are good. And, and yet I look at those and I kind of say, maybe these will be our responses to the theme that I've chosen for this year. That that's how we as God's children will, resp will respond to bring him glory this year. And so for this year, um, the, the theme, I'm going to give it to you and explain, and then we're going to look at some scripture to help us understand. And we're just going to scratch the surface because it's the first Sunday of the new year. But for this year, our theme is going to be this. What does God have in store in 2024? And as Gretchen puts that slide up, some of you are saying, uh-oh, this guy mentioned it at our elders meeting. Remember last time you said God's vision is 2020? That was COVID year, my friends. 
Do you, I mean, it was t we're t do you remember we said God's vision is 2020? That was four years ago. And, and look at what we experienced, right? But I want you to understand that was not my fault. <laughs> I couldn't have brought that to pass. But I know who did. You know, we learned and grew in that year, for some of us, like we had never grown. That's what God does when times are challenging, when we're confused, when we don't know what's ahead. <clears throat> it forces us to trust him and to obey and to walk closer. And so you think, well, well what does God have in store in 2024? Okay, Mark's opening the door to a bunch of calamity and challenges and things. And, and folks, that could be true, but please understand, that's not because it's our theme. That's because our, our wonderful Heavenly Father, the Creator God, who is eternal and sovereign and absolutely in control, all-powerful, everywhere pleasant, present, all-wise, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Do I need to go on? Yeah, we could, because this is... He's in control of whatever we're going to face this year. And He's not going to waste it. And it's not arbitrary. It's not random or chance. It's not as luck would have it. It's not fatalism. It's not consequence. What did you tell me about consequence this week? Yeah, pretty good way to, to think of consequence. It's God remaining anonymous. He's in control. He's caused, we just studied that last year. God is causing all things to work together for good. Not all things are good, but he's causing them to work together for good for those who love him, who are the called according to his purpose. And so as we transition into this next year, into 2024, and, and I don't know what it'll bring, and neither do you, and neither does anybody else who says they do. It, it, it's something that I believe can be good for us, but as you can see, that slide has three ellipsis points. The, the theme's not over with that slide. It says, what does God have in store in 2024? And that's going to be our daily life and the, the challenges we face, the high times, the low times, the current events of my life, of yours, the world events. That's how we're going to relate to them. But the theme goes on, and this is where it connects to last year and even the year before that. Because the theme for this year is, what does God have in store in 2024 and forevermore. Do, do you see, this is where it gets exciting as God's children. This is where we see that he, he's redeemed us by his grace through faith. And as Greg read from Ephesians chapter 2, we were dead in our trespasses, but he made us alive together in Christ by grace we have been saved. And, and it says that he's He's already has in the ages to come a plan. And it is to bring him glory for all eternity. And his concept that he began before he created the world that, that we've looked at. Gretchen, go ahead and put those slides up, if you will, that we had in our Christmas season. His concept before he created the world and, and then the conflict that, that, he, that he, he planned for. He, he allowed that conflict because this is the way to exalt his glory and to humble us. And the conflict took place so we could understand redemption and grace and forgiveness and sacrificial love so we could know what redemption is. And it, that conflict between good and evil continues to the focal point. We just celebrated Christmas and it takes us through Easter where, where on the cross he, he conquered and he crushed the head of the serpent and rose again three days later, that's the focal point of his story, of history. It just is. 
And now we are living in this, this crescendo, this building time that's going to ultimately culminate in his consummation, in his finalization, his completion of what he began before he spoke the world into existence. This is our God. And I want us to focus on that as we're seeing it and, and relate it to everyday life, to whatever we're going to experience. I don't know what God has in store in 2024, but I know he does, and he's not going to waste it. He's going to cause it to work together for good. That allows me to trust him. That allows you to have hope. That allows us to have stability in an in unstable world. To find our security and our satisfaction, our stability in our relationship with, with the God who never changes, who is eternal. And I believe there's a number of things we can experience this year with this theme. And I just want to give you a few of them that we're going to discuss over the year, over this year. And unless Jesus comes back and then we'll be learning at his feet for all eternity with none of the, the barriers that we have now. Wow, that would be wonderful. But some of the things we'll, we'll plan to, to discuss, things like heaven and hell. I, I, I mean, to, to see what God's word talks about when, when, when we talk about heaven and hell. And therefore, we'll probably talk some about angels, both the elect angels and the evil angels, the, the, the angels that, that continue to serve and worship God continuously, as well as the fallen angels and that are called demons. We'll, we'll, we'll spend some time looking at what is heaven going to be like? What does God have in store forevermore? So we'll, we'll look at that because in doing that, we'll begin to develop what God wants his children to have, an eternal perspective, to realize that eternity matters way more than Moment by moment, moment by moment. In fact, eternity will be bringing glory and honor to God for all eternity. And our understanding of what he has in store forevermore can change the way that I and you, that we all see day-to-day -day life. It gives us a grid to help us understand what's really important. What will last? What really matters? Where should my values be placed? Where are my priorities, the decisions, my goals? All of that stuff that is going to happen in 2024. What God has in store in 2024, current events, day-to-day -day events for his children should be viewed through the lens of eternity, of the eternal because that's our God, instead of pouring all of our resources and energy and our priorities and our values into here and now, to be laying up treasures in heaven that'll last for you. Do you see the difference in eternal perspective? Studying about what God has in store for his children forevermore should help us live better day to day, focused in order to bring him glory, that eternal perspective, I believe it, it changes how and why we live now. We'll look at his overall purpose and plan to, to bring glory to himself from, from creation to eternity, from eternity past to eternity future. Uh, the idea that we had up there from concept to consummation, uh, but we'll also... Uh, It'll add additional insight into Christ in me, the hope of glory in 2023. Because the hope of glory is what we'll experience, but the realities for you and me that know him, that change has already begun. I'm a new person in Christ. Old things have passed away. New things have come. And so we'll take another street off of the main street from last year. And it'll become our main street, but they dovetail together. We'll actually spend some time studying in Revelation. Spend some time studying in the prophets. And that's what takes us back a little bit to read the Bible through in 2022 and see God's worldview for you. Many of you said that was one of the most helpful themes. It was for me as, as your pastor and for many of you as we discussed God's big picture that year. And you were reading through and we were on the same page. But if you remember, that's a lot to cover in a year. And so we kind of ran through the prophets. 
There just wasn't time. Uh, and I'm not going to say we're going to camp there all, all year, but we're going to look back at some of those prophetic passages and help to understand, especially those that apply to, to heaven and future and kingdom and what God has in store forevermore. And we'll try to put those together as we... We didn't spend a lot of time in Revelation that year, did we? It was at the end of the year, and, and you know what we ran into? Christmas season. In those last five weeks, as you were reading through Revelation, we were studying, and we tried to tie some overview, but that's where I believe God has for us to, to look at what does God have in store in 2024 to view the daily events of life through the lens of eternity and forevermore and allow him to change our lives and to conform us closer and closer to Jesus. Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 3. And I'm going to go through this very quickly because we want to transition to the Lord's Supper here. And so I'm probably going to speed through some of these verses. Acts chapter 1, you know, it's, it's Luke volume 2, basically. And we find Jesus with his apostles, his closest followers, and he's died, he's been buried, he's risen again, and for 40 days he's ministered to them. The text there in chapter 1, they've been discussing things about the kingdom. And, and, and as he gets there, he, he brings them to the Mount of Olives, and, and they've got some questions for him and stuff. And he's going to ascend into heaven. He's going to say, you wait in Jerusalem to the power from on high comes. That's the Holy Spirit. Because when he fills you, you're going to be empowered to be my witnesses. And that's exactly what happened in Acts chapter 2. 120 of them waiting in the upper room. The Holy Spirit comes, fills them. They begin to speak and teach and mighty wind, exciting things happening as the Holy Spirit is coming to them. And they begin to witness. Peter stands up with the other apostles there and they speak God's word. He takes Old Testament truths and he likens them to current events and says, Jesus is the fulfillment. He is Messiah and you need to respond. The Holy Spirit works and 3,000 souls are saved at Pentecost. That's 50 days after Jesus was crucified for us. Pentecost takes 50, place 50 days after Passover and Jesus was crucified on Passover. So you have all of that stuff that's, that's going on. And, and the church is together and they're growing and people are getting saved. God's adding to their number daily those who are being saved. And they're involved in worshiping him in the instruction of his word. Uh, they're fellowshipping intimately with one another. There's evangelism taking place as they're sharing the good news and people are getting saved. And they're serving one another and that's happening. And now we come to Acts chapter 3 verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. This is early Christian church. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb, a little bit later in the text it's going to say he's been lame since, since he was conceived inside the womb. And when the religious leaders see the miracle that's going to take place, they're going to say he's in his 40s. For four, over 40 years, he was born with it, and he's not been able to walk. You get the picture? Not just a, a few days, weeks, or even a year or two. 40 years, over 40 years. It says, a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they, they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful in order for him to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. That was what he was destined for. That's all he could do. He had no way to make money, so he's a beggar. They set him down for those going into the temple that they'll have compassion and give to him. Do you get it? That's what he's doing. Verse 3, when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, look at us, focus here is what he's saying. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. He's, he's thinking, man, I've got their attention. They're going to give me a bunch of money. And here's what Peter says in verse 6. I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk! 
And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright. I love that way that Luke, with a leap, this guy's jacked up. He hasn't walked ever, 40 some years. He's been healed by God, strengthened. He feels the strength in his feet and his ankles. And it says, and with a leap, he stood up and he began to walk. He didn't have to learn. God just miraculously heal. It's tremendous. And he uses Peter and John to do that. And he, the, he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praying. Can you picture this guy? Ah, praise God. Look, guys, I can. Look, he, this is this guy that's been healed. And he's entering the temple. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. They, they knew who he was. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together. And so-called portico of, the, of Solomon. They were full of amazement, verse 12 says. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or our piety, our, our reverence, our, our righteousness, we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant or his son, Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murder to be granted to you, Barabbas. Verse 15, but you put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus, his credibility, his authority, his nature, uh, his essence. It's, it's through the name of Jesus and who he is. That's what has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance just as the, your rulers did. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of the prophets, look at this, the things that God had told us thousands of years earlier through the mouths of the prophets, that his Christ, his Messiah, would suffer. He has thus fulfilled. It's come to pass in our lifetime. Therefore, Respond is what he says in verse 19. Repent. You're headed the wrong way. You've got to turn. You've got to change and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. You've got to, you're headed the wrong way. You've got to stop and, and turn and come to Jesus to see that he is the Christ. Place your faith in him. You've got to depend on him. He's the promised Messiah. He's telling them, you got to get saved. And it says that something's going to happen eventually order, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. In other words, he starts taking their current events. He says, this is Jesus. It's been prophesying that he would come. He came. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for our sins. And God raised him from the dead. He's going to eventually say that neither is there, there, there salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we might be saved. So he's taking those Old Testament prophets and he's showing them, it's Jesus. You're headed the wrong way. You need to repent and believe believe in him. Do you see the picture? But he doesn't stop there. He also starts saying, guys, there's other things written in the prophets that did not get fulfilled when he first came. There's other stuff that's going to happen. And if you want to be a part of that time of refreshing and restoration, you must place your faith in Christ because it's not over. 
And, and you see, that's the period in which we live. He's taking God's word and he's applying it to everyday life. And he's challenging them. If he came and did it like he said he would in, in the Old Testament prophets and we're witnesses, we've experienced it. Guess what? He's coming again. And there's more to go. And his rule and reign will be forevermore. Verse 22, he says, Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like, from, like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. It's Deuteronomy 18 that he's referring to in verse 23. And it will be that every soul that does not heed the prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. There is a cost for rejecting. There is a cost for those who do not place their faith in him. And it's called destruction. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and all of his successors onward also announced these days, it is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first... God raised up his servant, his son, and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. And, and I know it's a lot of verses, but you get the picture of what he's doing. The, the miracle catches their attention. He shares the truth. That Jesus came like he said he would. And if he came like he said he would, you better look at the other Old Testament prophecies because they say he's coming again and eventually will establish a kingdom that will not end. And we start seeing this picture here in the book of Acts that, that, that helps us to understand that, you know, the whole idea, what does God have in store for 24, for 2024? I don't know, but he does. And his plan will take place and culminate and go on forevermore. And so Peter and John, are they're speaking, the priests come and they take him and they throw him in jail with the, the, the man that they got healed. You, you get what I mean? They, they've got him in jail. They wait for the leaders to gather the next day. And as they do, the, the leaders, they come in and this is chapter 4. And I'm not going to read it all. We'll come to this a little bit next week. But eventually they, they ask, in, in whose name and whose authority are you doing these things? And they say, in Jesus, he's the one that's healed him. And they point directly at them. In fact, it, it says in the text there, back in chapter 4, uh, verse 4, but many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000 5, men, probably some women and children too. Thousands come to faith in Christ because they understand the connection of the prophecies into their current events. And they trust they were going this way. They repent and confess it's wrong. I need Jesus. He's Messiah. He's coming again. And what ends up happening, they get threatened. Starting in verse 13, the leaders start railing on him. You can't do this. We don't want you talking in this name of the name of Jesus. They thought they'd gotten rid of him. Boy, did they not understand the explosion that took place. Once he died, was buried, and rose again and ascended to the Father. Couldn't stop it. And so it says, jump down there telling Peter and John, you can't be talking. Verse 19 of chapter 4, Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you guys be the judge. <laughs> Who should we believe, you or God? Who should we take to heart, you or God? I'll let you guys, you religious leaders, decide that. But for us, verse 20, for we cannot stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them on account of the people because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. God was accomplishing his will even though they were trying to stomp it out. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. When they had been released, they went to their own companions. This is Peter and, and John and, and this new 
convert, the, the lame man that's been healed. They come to their friends, the followers, and they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, Oh God, take away this persecution. Don't let them hurt us. Get rid of all of our problems. Make it easy. No challenge. That's not what they pray. And I don't know what God has in store in 2024, and neither do you, but I know that he will use it for our good. He'll knock off rough edges. He'll refine us. He'll challenge us. He'll be our comfort, and our focus needs to be, what do you have in store forevermore? Because that helps me make decisions that please him moment by moment by moment. They don't ask for that. They say they lift their voices and with one accord and unity, and they say, O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. They go back to creation. And we would have too, except I've run out of time. So we'll pick this up next week. But I want you to see who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our... Father David, your servant, and he starts referring to Psalm 2. He starts bringing that, that prophecy and the Old Testament truth to verse 27. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, and the Gentiles, and the people of Israel. Now look at verse 28. These bad guys... These people yelling, crucify him. These people saying, let Barabbas go. They were all choosing to do that. This was their desire. That they, they were doing that. That was their responsibility. But verse 28 says, to do whatever your God, your hand, and your purpose predestined to occur. You see, God had a concept before he even created the world. And it's going to take place. And it involved the crucifixion of his son, Jesus Christ, slain before the foundation of the world because that's the only way he could redeem us, rescue us, because we've all turned our back and fallen short of his glory. It's called sin. We need a savior. And, and yet these guys were making their own choices doing it, and yet it was part of God's program, his concept. And now, Lord, take note of their threats. Grant that your bondservants, us, may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And we read that and we say, wow! Do you understand? That's the same God that is working in our lives today. And our current events some 2,000 years later are still under his control. And that's why our focus this year, and there's so much more to, to discover together this year, to explore in 2024, what he has in store and, and what it'll be like forevermore should change the way that we live now, today, tomorrow. And that requires that we respond in faith and obedience and trust and hope and belief and loving and knowing him and growing him so that the things that happen to me and to you day by day this year, we know God has prepared them in advance. As Greg read in Ephesians 2, where his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared in advance. We just walk in them. That gives us confidence, hope. So we trust him moment by moment. And he takes us to the cross.